Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, doesn't sound too creepy hearing my own voice today. That's always a uh, progress there. It is strangely weird, try it sometime. It's very, very odd to hear yourself. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Tim. The worship was awesome today. I think we all know that. And the presence of the Lord is in this place. Undescribable. Indescribable. Uh, in particular, when I heard the piano, and I don't know what you call it, the percussion instrument in back, that was absolutely awesome. I just felt, felt so much, uh, I guess, talent and pleasure coming out of you guys and just the free-flowing spirit. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's a good place to be. And as Tim was saying, our pastor is down south being a guest preacher at, a, at another church today, which is awesome. It's great to see, you know, the churches coming together and not being so segmented and separated. And I was uh, actually talking with pastor last week after church, and we were kind of putting our minds together just more about the vision of the church. What we want to be is everyone's church. What that means to the congregation here in Mount Vernon and what it means online in 2020, 2022 with the pandemic with being online, with having what we have available to us. I mean, Billy Graham in the 1960s, I guess, they said he, he, he preached to the amount of people that would have been half of the population in the world. And this was just with TV and traveling. What excuse do you have not to be spreading your faith with people? You know, what excuse do we not have as a church not to be leveraging this collectively, spreading the gospel? You don't need to be qualified. You don't have to have an ordained from anything. Just read the Bible. Know the Lord. You can talk about it. People will know what you're saying, whether it's true, whether it's not. Your Holy Spirit will recognize the Spirit in someone else. I promise you. I promise you. So, uh, and also in terms of everyone's church, we also want to be a church of apologetics. Apologetics is a fancy word for explaining with logic and truth and rational thinking how and why we believe what we believe. Not just we believe all these crazy Holy Spirit things and we talk about dreams. We want to know pragmatically and we want to be convinced that what we're believing is real, right? We don't want to be believing crazy fantasy stuff. We don't want to be viewed as crazy by the world, although we kind of have to expect that if they can't see what we see. We say we have to be ready for that. But we have to be ready and eager to explain our faith to people around us. I think that's just a basic responsibility and a tenant of being a believer. And so that's today's message. It's going to be talking a little bit about satiation, specifically from a spiritual perspective. It comes from the, the argument that we're not just animals. We're not just machines. We're not just here to reproduce, to eat and die and to be forgotten. That we have a yearning for more. We have a yearning to connect for the immortal, for the intangible. I mean, look at the movies that you watch. Look at the novels that you read. The most heralded stories are all these uh, intangible, epic self-actualization stories of becoming. They're not like, yeah, just eat and, and reproduce and then get old and get hurt and die. That's, that's not what they're about. You wonder why. Are we, we're all just crazy and make up our own fantasies or maybe there's something in here that is there for a reason that we should, you know, kind of just examine, sniff, and use our brain to kind of deduce why, why those desires might be there. So that being said, today's uh, topic is going to be on spiritual satiation or emaciation. And so uh, if you would, please bow your, uh, bow your head and close your eyes in prayer today. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, you are above us in ways that we can never perceive, never fully grasp, Lord, but we know that you are El Shaddai. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the first and the last. You, everything we are and see and do is from you, by you, and will ultimately be back to you. We ask that with that attitude, uh, you humble our hearts, you make us meek, you allow lies that have uh, made us ignorant to be gone, uh, allow us to be strong enough to be honest with our hearts, Lord God, and to look deep into what you want to say to us today and be strong enough to receive it, because we don't have to rely on our, on our strength, Father, but on yours. Um, anoint our ears, anoint my lips today, and allow your spirit to be here with us, and allow us to be in, indelibly changed. Amen. Okay, so everyone, can you say satiation? Satiation. No slurs. Pretty good, guys. All right. So that means to satisfy a need or a desire, fully or to excess. Satiation is what we all want, right? Food, we want satiated. Water, we want satiated. Sleep, satiated. You can think of a few other ones. I'll leave them at that. We like to be satiated with our desires. It's how we're made. Can you say emaciated? Emaciated. emaciated is the opposite of satiated. It is what happens when we are completely without what we need to survive. It's abnormally thin or weak. 
It's like when a car is running on fumes. It's sputtering. It's not right. It's about to die, actually. It's barely hanging on. And here's one you guys will know. Hangry. You guys heard that term, hangry? hangry. Kirsten, what does hangry mean? Angry and hungry at the same time. Right? It means when people have needs that aren't met, they don't realize it, but it can take over their whole attitude. Yeah. Just as simple as anger. You can be angry or you can be angry at people because you're hungry. You don't even know it, but you'll take it out on someone. I've caused fights with people. Serious fights. And I'll blame them and think it was something they did and it was just I was hungry. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, we're, we are that close to being just so illogical. We think we're so rational, but we're not. We're very not. Uh, but that being said, first illustration is going to be talking about something we all know, use every day. And it's, it's just machines. So let's say a car. Simple car, right? Men create cars. We create them. The car is not alive. We design it for a purpose. We design its fuel. We designed everything. We know what we want it to do. We planned it. We designed every aspect of it. Yeah. Keith, do you know what a Ferrari is? Oh, yeah. What's a Ferrari? It's a very high-end Italian sports car. Awesome. Perfect. What, what, do you know what a Pontiac Fiero is? What? What's a Pontiac Fiero? It's a, a low-end American-made sports car. Exactly. It kind of looks the same if you compare them side by side, but they are entirely different vehicles. Yeah. The fuels they require are entirely different vehicles, are different things. Do they do the same basic idea? Yes, they move people from one to another. But in the function, in the efficiency, in what they run on, they are basically categorically different things. But they're still the same. They, they move things from one place to another. So we know just from what we discussed, fuel is extremely important. It, it, the type of fuel, uh, if you put gasoline in a steam engine, it's not going to work. If you put water into a Ferrari, why wouldn't it work? You don't just throw whatever you want into whatever you want and expect it to work, right? That would be insane. We know this throughout our entire lives, everything, how we feed ourselves. Uh, inputs and outputs are common things that we know. I mean, have any of you guys ever borrowed a car, like borrowed a diesel and then taken it to a gas station? Yeah, I've had friends do that. It's bad news. Yeah, don't lend your car out unless the person knows. Uh, or have you guys ever made the mistake of going to Taco Bell after church, having a nacho bel grande and two bean burritos? You know, the wrong fuel, the bad outputs come later. You know, you might have a little sputtering, a little backup. Something's not quite working right. You know, it's because it's junk food. You know, it's imitation food. I guarantee if you eat really good USDA choice, grandma cooked farm food, you don't have that indigestion. You just won't. You'll feel fine. It's because you're made to work on it. You can operate on the junk, but it won't be as good. It won't be the way you want. So as, as we were covering, fuel's really important. And the basic idea is with an engine, uh, how it works very specific to get the explosion, to get the work done that we want. So now we're going to take that concept and bring it up a few levels of magnitude higher, right? Not squared, but cubed. We're going up. And we're going to be talking about physical fuel. Not mechanical fuel, physical fuel for physical bodies. Not just us, but think about groundhog, squirrels, geese, anything alive, anything that really lives that we know about, that we, we just understand is alive. Not metaphysical crap, artistry, the, the idea is alive, no. Just live with blood that you can kill. So this life, this bios, uh, C.S. Lewis calls it bios when he likes talking about Christianity. Bios is what separates us from stupid, not stupid, dead lifeless things like a machine. We have BIOS, they don't. We create those machines to do certain work. We also do work. Flesh does work. Creatures do work all the time. But compared to a machine, it's vastly different. Oh my goodness, it's so much more varied. Exponentially different. And I'm not even talking humans, I'm talking animals, Stu stupid animals. They have skills, they can develop, they can learn. They can do tools, they can create tools, they can get smarter, they can build things, they can collectively organize, they can communicate, they can find a mate, they can reproduce, they can protect, they can protect against threats, they can work as a unit to achieve very crazy goals. Yeah. This is mind blowing. If you were a creature and all you ever knew was machines, if someone were to say, oh, it's, it's, uh, dream up an animal, something different, you would never possibly conceive of an animal being that vastly different. It's, it's as different from a machine as God is to us, in theory. That much different, actually. That much separate from it. And because living things 
have so much different varied work that we do compared to just an engine which runs and goes, we also have different fuel. And that would make sense, right? Engines just explode. They go up and down with a the piston. They need gasoline, they need air, and they need a spark. That's all they do. Do, 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 As we just covered, animals do crazy amounts of things, all different stuff. They have brains, they think, they plan, they have tools. Because of that, the fuel is exponentially more intense, more deep, more nuanced. If I drank petrol, what would happen? I would get sick and die, right? My body would break down. If you stuffed a banana in a gas tank, the Ferrari wouldn't go anywhere. Right. Yeah, it wouldn't go anywhere. But Ferraris still only take high octane fuel, maybe jet fuel. That's all they take, right? Very specific. Us, our bodies are crazy because we can actually fix ourselves. If that's not divine, I don't know what is. You can damage it and it creates a new flesh. That blows our mind if we just take five minutes to think about it. Machines can't do that. And it's because of the fuel we take in. It's precisely because of the fuel we take in is more varied, more in-depth than oil. Oil doesn't repair the machine. It's simply the fuel, for, it's the calories. If the fuel would be like calories, what about, what about the amino acid for building? What about the branch chain amino acids, right? What about the lipids, the fat? All the things in our bodies, vitamins, minerals. If we just had fat every day for calories, we'd die. That's not enough. We need to build and repair. We need to get inputs that sustain this life. It, we know this, right? It's pretty, pretty key to our nature. And when I was thinking about it, I was really, you know, okay, so what's similar and different between bodies and machines? It, it blew me away is that a car we can tell really easily if we messed up and put in the wrong fuel. We'll know immediately. It's going to not run, or it's going to sputter really, really, really bad. Or if you go old school with carburetors and the air fuel mixture is wrong, it runs lean or rich, and either way, it's not right. You know that. But with humans and our bodies, or even animals, we can get by, I mentioned this briefly before, eating all kinds of food and fuel. We don't have to have our one type of fuel or we die. I know people that eat McDonald's every day. They're fine. Oh, well, they're not fine, but my point is there are health ramifications, but they're more insidious and more hidden than with a machine. You don't know what they are. I could eat McDonald's every day, but run every day. So my cholesterol is really high. My heart's well, maybe decently good from the running, but the point is you could be really skinny and be extremely unhealthy, or you could be a sumo wrestler. You look fat and obese, but he's got way more muscle on him than a lineman. His health is healthy as a horse, but you don't know. So it's, it's, easy, it's easy to... Uh, be fooled by that. You know, someone may look like, oh, you must just, you take such good care of yourself. And it's like, no, I just really work out because I'm insecure, but I eat like crap and I have no self-control whatsoever. If only, or I just take a bunch of drugs to stay skinny all the time. You wouldn't even know, right? You wouldn't know. That's right. So it's hard to really assess the performance just based on the outside looking in. And just as bad fuel will break down a Ferrari, you know, it won't knock, it won't explode, it's not designed to run on that, um, over time the junk food will break down our body. It will. It will take time, but it will. It will. Um, bless his heart, my father, I don't know all the reasons, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's only because of junk food, but let's just say my father went to be with the Lord, I'd say really early, you know, I think it was like mid-50s, and he was also 450 pounds, and I know he dealt with a lot of issues with regard to self-control and food and satiation and hope and biblical tenets that we're discussing now, having needs that if we don't get filled by the right or a certain way, we're going to reach elsewhere to feed them. And that's where the breakdown occurs. And that's the issue in our hearts that we have to assess before we just grab, grab, grab and push everyone down uh, as we're struggling to stay above water ourselves. You know, that's, that's the issue of Christians, how we want God to feel that so we don't have to be reaching out and so needy all the time. And uh, health is serious, there's no doubt, right? We all know health is a real deal. Food, what we take in, how we feel about ourselves. It's not a joke, it's not fantasy. We have bodies, they, they change depending on what you take. You get fat or you feel good, hot, stomach ache. And uh, I hate to tell you guys, we gotta wake up, but you know what happens to these bodies? Every one of us knows what happens to these bodies. Where's it going? From dust to dust. Everyone, everyone listening, yeah, it's, it's banal, you've heard it. Think about it for a minute. Everything you're living for is gone. In 50 years, you won't be here. Your spouse won't be here. 100 years, you won't be here. Your career is not going to matter. Anything you said on Facebook, no one's going to care. It's gone. 
So, so it's reasonable to want to protect this life. It's scary. It's all we know. We, yeah, of course you want to protect it. Sure, I want to eat good and all this stuff. But now think about how knowing that, that, that what you take in is important to your health and knowing that health is good to steward because that's all we have. We could lose it. What do we see in society knowing these very obvious things, right? Um, but, and it's, we all have different approaches to this fact. Um, some admit it and fight really hard to eat healthy. You know, they do everything they can to fight it head on and sacrifice all the goods and tasty things and they just commit to the goal immediately. Some maybe don't do it the best, but, but they know they should and they fight and they do their best to like teach their kids they know you shouldn't eat junk food. You should, you should really like the good stuff. It's better for you. It'll guide you later. Some know they're screwed, don't want to learn anything about their health, don't care, just, just blown away by it. They hire a trainer. They say, I'll give you my sovereignty. I'll just pay you money. You tell me what to do, what to eat. And they have freedom in that. It's beautiful because, you know, they just tell you, I bought a trainer. I don't have to worry about it. That's Jesus. But it comes later, you know. But it's, 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 that's the idea, that you have someone that can take the reins and answer all the questions that you never knew how to do. And it is too good to be true. And so... Uh, C.S. Lewis talks more about this bios, right? And he says, basically, the nefarious thing about life is that when we're here, it's cool. Life is good. There's a lot of great things that we like. And the problem is, they are things that are good, but we mistake them for the ultimate. And that's when we get tricked. And that's when the snare gets our mouth, and we get basically surprised and, is that better? Thrown on our butts with surprise that everything is, in a sense, cursed with the same bios. Everything at all. Everything you like, whether it's childhood friends you like to hang out with, playing football, it's enjoyments, merriments, vacations, love. Everything goes. Um, but we feel deep down that something's wrong with that. We don't feel that's normal. We feel that we want it to continue. There ought to be a reason I feel like I should be immortal, or I want to stay longer, or I want to create works that hang around longer than just my life, or why do I feel like I'm the same that I'm as a 16-year-old, but my body's aging? Or, or, or more so when my grandma, she's 85, she goes, you know how weird it is? I feel, I mean, yeah, I'm a little slow, Ryan, but I'm just as passionate, just as hungry as I ever was, and my body's taking me out of this. I go, oh, it's not taking you out of your grandma. You're explaining, this is exactly what the Bible explains to you. While our outside is wasting away, we're renewed every day. Day. I mean, that's it. So C.S. Lewis is really torn by this. He goes, this is just horrific. My, my lot here on earth is just trash because everything I love is going to be stripped from me. So what's the point? That's pretty nihilistic. It's, I don't even want to just kill myself now. Nothing to look forward to. And in C.S. Lewis, it was really troubling him. And he got to the point where he's thinking, well, everything else I see in my life, there's needs, uh, there's desires, and there's satisfaction. There's needs, desires, and satisfaction. Ducks want to swim, they have web feet, there's water for them. We have sexual desires, there's sex. We have, uh, okay, why do we have this desire for immortality? What the hell is this? Why is this in me? Do dogs have this going crazy? I'm not going to live forever, what's going on? I've got to figure this out. Why is it just humans? What's this going on? And he goes, he says when he, he stumbled upon Christianity because of angst in his heart like this, that he began to think and, and read he was a medieval literature scholar, knew all about the old myths and Norse mythologies, and was all familiar with old religions. He was. But liked them, but didn't find them very convincing. Got into Christianity, fought it a lot, and said, oh my goodness, it's too real. I can't put it down. It's so uncomfortable, I know it's real. It's so improbably perfect. Oh, God, it's just, it's just how life is. How life is that way. And he says this bios... Uh, action, which fades and dies, leads to something that God wants to impart into us specifically, and not animals, but specifically as humans. And C.S. Lewis calls this Zoe. And this Zoe, this new, this new life that God imparts in us, is what we all sense, what we all know, what we all experience, but we can't put a finger, we can't put a thumb on it, except for Christians or people that chase after God to say, hey, this is it. This is the one I'm going all in. This makes more sense than any other thing that I've been pitched uh, I, I like what he's saying more than any other like comprehensive thought I've heard from this guy. And it, it's... Um, I got off on a tangent there. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, so we've talked about machines. Uh, you know, the fuel's really important. How they significantly and spiritually differ from even basic bodies, animal bodies, right? Um, significantly different in their capability, in their fuels, and why they were created. And uh, 
So we were talking about these yearnings that we have, and I think we all agree that we've had these and we know what we're talking about. They're hard to necessarily concretely say because they're metaphysical, right? Metaphysical, they're not necessarily here, they're intangible. You can talk of them, but you can't see them. You can't grab them with your hand. But I mean, proof is in the pudding. I have to ask everyone online who's watching, friends, family. I have nuclear physicists in my family, smart guys who know how to think that sometimes don't think when they could. I'll ask you guys, uh, do you really think your mind and your spirit and your experience on this earth is equitable to that as a rat or a pig or a guinea fowl or one of those birds that you shoot at and they jump or a goldfish you smack them they come back and you smack them again they're just stupid do we really think that all of humanity all of evolution all of this was really just nothing and we have no purpose and your thoughts and yearnings are all purposeless and the thoughts that you have that they're meaningless are also meaningless so you shouldn't even believe in your meaningless thoughts it's all garbage right you gotta you gotta push yourself a little bit what i mean people who don't believe we're more than animals people that believe we have no soul we have no destiny all these yearnings are just machinations created stuff i love to talk to you because you got some good faith I would love to have your faith in everything you see, in music and beauty, things that you exalt and want to dance, uh, the beauty of with science, the depth of science, all of nature, all of creation, the beauty, paradoxes in time and space, the contradictions in your own understanding and paradoxes of romance, love, your own actions and inability to do what you want, the beauty of music, none of this echoes to you from eternity. It's all meaninglessness. Well, I think that's what God would call confusion and denial. And uh, how do you say? It's a misplaced yearning for something that God says he planted in us. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I look around, I see our society, specifically in the Western United States, more desperate for purpose and meaning and morality and being pure than ever before. You look online, people attacking each other over masks, fighting each other. You didn't get a shot. Well, it doesn't matter if you're not. Oh, it's just crazy, you know? Saying you're wrong, losing friends. I mean, people are yearning to be right, for a passion to take a stand. That's evidence, but it's schizophrenic and crazy. You listen to these people, they'll, they'll be like, I think I've said this before, it blew me away. I was back at Columbia University and someone had posted on a buy and sell Facebook group, a female. It was a series of shirts, right? And there were convenient pictures of her chest blown up. And it was like, and some guy wrote like, wow, what are you selling? Like, that seems really odd. Your breasts are a bigger part of the picture than the brand of shirt. And these, I would say, social justice warriors that saw this went on and said, how dare you comment on this girl's breasts? When it was like very evident, it was a weird post. It made no sense. It was very rational for this guy to say this. And people ganged up on this guy. You sick, twisted, pervert, malicious, blah, blah, blah. Where do you work? Someone else posted, I found out. I looked this guy's name. He works at so-and-so. Let's raise him. Let's burn him down. Let's take his life out. And I'm like, that is the most vindictive evil I've ever seen. And these people think they're doing right. They think they're being like virtues, like let's destroy your life and make you feel horrible for maybe an accidental overstep. But you are intentionally causing evil and you don't see that paradox. That's insane to me. That's what the Bible says. You know, you with a log in your eye. How dare you think, hey, come here, let me get the speck out of your eye. You can't even balance. You have a log in your eye. This is, I see this everywhere in society. It's crazy. And the louder people scream, the more suspect their logic is. So be aware when you see this online, man. These people often can't argue themselves out of a wet paper bag. Don't feed the trolls. Don't, don't try to talk to them. It doesn't work. They just want to fight. They don't want truth. They just want to fight. Don't do it. Don't do it. And furthermore, it's like I was saying, all the books I was raised on, I love fantasy books. I love fantasy books. Lord of the Rings, Red Wall, animals that had swords and fought. In, in uh, all, the, all the best movies, there were all self actualization. You know, the, the poor, unloved hero from the poor family being chosen, set apart. Why? He doesn't know. He didn't deserve it. But something more magnificent, power, chose that, planted something. And teachers recognize this and inspire him. He begins to believe. He begins to get stronger, fails, not sure. It is always this predictable thing, but this has been studied by literature writers forever. And C.S. Lewis is like, it echoes so much the Christian heart, the story of the Bible, the thing that is in all of our arts. The thing we love the most is exactly what's from the Bible. Read it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, poetry sings of eternal love. Every fantasy.
actually every fantasy story is idealized as happily ever after. That's always what we want. That's our hearts around the world for all of history. We want permanent acceptance. We want permanent love. We want, that's what we want. We want comfort. I don't know about you, I remember being really depressed as a child when I would go see a movie like Braveheart or see an epic movie that was about sacrifice and like altruism and like epic fighting and yes. And then when it would be over, I was like depressed because I was like, wait, this is fantasy and I gotta go back to real life now. Oh, my mom left my dad and it's a broken relationship. And oh, like that was really it. And, and I don't think that's the case. I think all of us know what I mean when we've experienced these emotions and it's just a little bit sadder to realize it's not quite that way when we hope it would or could or should be. And again, C.S. Lewis argues very effectively that these emotions, these ideals, and these longings aren't worthless and they aren't to be ignored. They should lead you to suspect and inquire as to if there's something more in your life that you need to feed that goes beyond your sex, your money, your identity. They should lead you to be considering that I may be not be eating something I need to be eating. I may be missing out on something that I could be having. And I think the self-actualization uh, shared by so many artists, so many athletes, um, is directly placed in God as us to change, nurture, grow, and become who we are in Him. And that's a paradox at the beginning. It's unclear. But uh, I can't tell you how it's going to work out for you other than that He commands you to take it up, to learn to feed on Him, and watch and see what happens. Um, and so obviously we're talking about some heavy stuff. You've got to question your own worldview. You know, those, those of you at home are not professed Christians. You have to decide and ask what it is you believe. What motivates you? Uh, what really gets you going? Is it just fear of being poor in your old age? Is it fear of being rejected by your family? Is it what motivates you and gets you going? What, what fears push you? Christians believe these yearnings come from the Bible. And they're perfectly set up and explained to us to rekindle this love that we forgot. That there are these in-depth, passionate yearnings that even relate to purity that we've forgotten about. That when we baptize ourselves and take a diet of spiritually nourishing things, we begin to wake up and have senses that we didn't have before. We begin to think about things in new ways that we haven't had. Heck, to enjoy praying. I remember, that's the craziest thing in the world. I enjoy praying now. I used to not enjoy praying. I used to think it was the stupidest thing. And let's be honest, man, have you guys been there? There's a problem if we don't like praying. Because we can like praying. So just that one miracle, guys. I mean, it's, I'm a testament. I could go on and on about this. Um, the Bible talks a lot about a first love. This life, or this Zoe. This free will that God gives us to make a choice to choose to nourish ourselves on the Most High, or on the banal and material, only. And if we only feed ourselves, well, you know what's going to happen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the word of God. God says he breathed life into us. That we're literally dust. I mean, I get it. We are. I mean, dust, they're just, they're, I mean, it's crazy that people say that things in stars that explode and go everywhere, if you broke your, your atoms down into their components, it's no different. Just arranged in a different way. Held together by, God says, divine breath. Some Christians, I feel, live like divine farts. You know, they just wafe around, polluting wherever they are, and kind of just, just putt around, you know? And that's not how we're meant to be. We're, we're dust to dust, yes. But in between, we're living through the breath of life, or through the breath of God, not by our own. Let's see what that is. Let's explore that, see what that says. Uh, Christians are amazed and spent because as you read the Bible, it's almost as if someone knew our exact plight. And that we would be wretched people. And that we would be confused and torn between what the world says and our desires and what this original love says we should do and it's better for us. And that we'd be torn. The Bible says that, that we're very much prone to wander. The Bible teaches you a lot about your own human heart, too. How you vacillate back and forth and how we're unstable in many things and the lack of commitment. And uh, how, how we tend to just, uh, we like to sandbag things. We like to get comfortable and we like to coast. I'm no different. We do. But as, as I was uh, talking with Jerry, God doesn't care about like what we do or what we produce. I think he cares about our heart and who we become. And the way we become what God wants us to become is by creating situations wherein we always have to rely on him. And that's a paradox because we don't ever want to rely on things. We want to be comfortable. We want to be self-sustained. I do. I want to coast. So God, God creates this... 
Oh, and quenchable thing is like you always get to be uncomfortable in a sense, but God's comfort is more than that, and it's enough. And you have to be hungry to keep coming, otherwise you won't need them, you know? So it's like, I'm not happy with it, but it's how it is, and we best learn. It's, uh, God tells us that we're kind of whores. He does. He says, you forgot your first love. Go read Hebrews. How many miracles did God do for these people? Deliver them time after time after time again. They say, you didn't love me, God. You, we had pots of meat to eat. You stole it. And God is like, what are you talking about? That, what is wrong with you? He would save them. They would say the most horrific things about him. He would deliver them. He was about to destroy them. And Moses is like, please, just don't kill them all. And it happened repeatedly. So God says, yes, they whore after the lust of their flesh and their heart. You forget me. You quickly forget me. He's, he's a loving and kind God, but he doesn't mince words, guys. We need to wake up. He said it very clearly. Uh, you said you loved me and you knew me, but you said I didn't have a lot. I never gave you a lot to follow, you guys. Come on. Be consistent with your faith. Be consistent with what you say you believe. Uh, ingest yourself with spiritual truth. Read the Bible. Surround yourself with believers. Walk the walk, guys. If he's bored, or don't. You know, but being in the middle is worse. Hearing some of God's promises and then falling out of it, being close with God and then being, I mean, that's a bad place to be. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really hard place to be. Um, yeah, C.S. Lewis talks a lot about that if you don't actually realize these needs are God-given, you will feel, you will fill them. And you're going to fill them if you're not strong in what you believe and what you're, where your truth comes from. You're going to fill them with whatever is easiest, which is whatever society says you should do. And that we're all that way. So, man, maybe you don't have a sense of self and who you are in God, but you got pride. You look pretty good compared to a lot of other people. Maybe you talk better, you got a nicer car. You don't need God, you're fine. Maybe you can see arrogance. Maybe your kids are really good. You're a mom, you're a great mom. Your kids are the best. Blah, blah, blah. Don't need God. Fine. Your, your career is awesome. Ambition, self, fine. Security. C.S. Lewis just says, we're not meant to run on those things. They'll fail us. We'll be depressed. And, I mean, you'll be suicidal, frankly. When all those things are taken away, if, if like, I, I won't say names. So there's people in my life that I know, because I've been. They derive a great amount of their sense of self from worldly things, which, in a sense, we are meant to be and to enjoy. But the point, if those were taken away, she would have absolutely nothing. She wouldn't have, she would kill herself. She, no. Them, them. So, and I think in our own hearts, I've been there too. I'd take, I'd never wanted to admit it, but I look at some of my past, some of the actions, some of the things that drove me. And it was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. And I wouldn't say it was godly ambition. I would say it was comparison. It was, it was uh, fear that other people put in me because they weren't godly, but they did the best they could. Um, and really, I, the fears also drive a lot of this. And God has a lot to say about fears and how, in a sense, we, we're always tempted to set ourselves up as God, but we know in the deepest hearts we're not God. We know we can't save ourselves. We know that we can't even validate ourselves because our standards change like the weather. We can't even keep our own standards, so how could we be God and save ourselves? You know, but that's the instinct. We, we, want, we want to do this. God says that we are set up to be worshipers, and we do fear things. And he says, you can fear him, and you fear nothing else. Fearing God allows you almost to get out of jail free card. And I think that's why people don't like the gospel. It's too good to be true. Yeah? No, no, I was worshiping. Oh, okay. Awesome. I thought you had a hand up. I said, contribute if you want. Hey, what did I say? I'm serious. God and nothing else. Yeah, it's like Jesus is like a good out of jail free card. He says, you can go after me and everything else will be taken care of. The world says, no. Impossible. No, that's crap. That's stupid. God says, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the stupid and make them look wise. That's right. Yeah, it, it's a paradox. It is a paradox. Put him first. How do I put him first? Put him first. Like you would anything else. If I were to tell you, put it first. You know what that means? You know what that means. All over the Bible it says people that put God first. It's possible you can do it. And we're here to help each other. We're here to nurture each other to do that. To teach and figure out how to do it. Because otherwise you're going to be caught up in the world. You're going to be caught up in COVID. You're going to be caught up in Ukraine. You're going to be caught up in all these vacillating things that come and go. And you're just... <laughs> And then your life is just a vapid fart. And like, what did you do? You had no consistency. You had no stability. What were you building your house on? Just, just the topic du jour. 
And it always struck me, it's like, we all know for kids, right? We don't want to spoil a kid. We all know it's really important, right? And it's not just, it is about physical health. It's about self-control. It's about fitness and sports. It is. But we know, we know there's something much deeper there. We know that if we let the kid eat what he prefers to do, he will kill himself. If he prefers to, if he eats whatever he wants, you let him choose it, he's going to choose Butterfinger. He's going to choose Butterfinger and Snickers. Laffy Taffy, maybe. But we know, we know we teach him that because it's a deeper spiritual wisdom. That what's obviously good for us is we don't instinctively want. And we have to nurture it, and we have to do it with discipline, and we have to choose the fuel that we put in deliberately. Because we know how to do it with fuel, with cars, we know how to do it with our own bodies, and we're going to be accountable with God for what we choose to put in. He makes that very, very clear. And it's so much more important, I mean, that you put in the right fuel for the Ferrari so it runs and doesn't sputter, for the, for the body so it stays healthy, and um, for the spirit, that when the body passes on, that we've developed a spiritual body that can take us up to be with our Heavenly Father. That's what he explains, and that begins right now. And I get it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was a Christian my whole life, and I would say I've been more of a Christian the past three years than I have been the past 30 years. And it's not to say I'm better now or anything, because we're all on our own walk. And God is, I cannot compare my walk or my revelation with God to yours. And no one ever can. Your, your walk is yours with God. And where you're at, you know. But just make sure you're walking. Make sure you're talking. Make sure you're experiencing and having that. That you're coming away every day after spending time with Him. And that people sense a difference on you. They sense a difference, it's a difference in your heart. That that is the proof, that is the evidence that will change people. It doesn't look like anything to you. That you're not shooting fireballs out of your hand, but I promise you people sense. Whether it's just souls, whether it's Jesus, all of the universe is attracted to Jesus Christ. And if he's in you, people are going to be attracted to you. They'll think it's your charisma, you'll think it's this, and you're like, no, it's not. It's not at all. I'm a nasty, angry, prideful guy. You would not want to hang out with me without Jesus. You know, it's... it's, it's uh, and it's just funny, Jesus, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he goes, you guys have your old ways because it's comfortable. You know, you, you thought you understood life, you thought you had God in a, in a little compartment on Sundays, it was all comfortable, you had your fun, everyone liked, you know, your heart wasn't in it for God though, because if it was, you'd, you'd want this new wine, you'd want this new information I'm telling you, you'd want it, why don't you want it, because you like the old because you're stuck with the old. So it's fine, have it. You have to be willing to say, oh, it really is, but maybe there's something better. You gotta be intrigued with what God says. And what they say, it's like the man who saw something in the field of immense value and treasure, and in that excitement, he went and threw everything he had in the sales, sold it so he could go and buy that. This is what it's like to capture the idea of what God offers to you. And he says not everyone can see it, not everyone can perceive it, but we pray for that today that we can, that our hearts will open up and that we can see and hear that, wow, taste and see that the Lord's message is good. That's awesome. And, uh, and that's okay. You might say, no, I don't, I don't think I need that fuel. I'm fine. I can watch a sermon. That's okay. If I had a conversation with a child, he would say he didn't need healthy food too. If, if I talked to a Ferrari, it might go, nah, nah, nah. he wouldn't tell me what kind of fuel it needed. That's okay. What makes you think you know what fuel you need? We don't even make the right decisions in and out half the time. Thank God for His grace, you know. And God knows this. Oh, He's so awesome. He says, come to me all who are burdened. Please, if you're confused, please come talk to me. If life scares you, talk about it. Be like David. Get on your knees every day. Throw your pride to the side. It's okay. Admit to other Christians you don't know what the hell is going on. It's okay. That's the one prerequisite to know. It's because we don't. Spiritual beings living in a mortal body, falling in the soil. It's craziness, you know. It's just to assume it's all normal would be to discredit your own self and your own heart. So be open. Be honest with yourself. We're freaking this out. And I was thinking, it's like, I think I saw in some movie, or was it The Matrix, that the oracle was a grandma? You know, the oracle, this head person, made was like a grandma. And I was like, I almost like to view God as my grandma, because my grandma is one of my best friends. I live with her, actually. And I was thinking, she is so real. Nothing freaks out my grandma. I talk about sex, murder, doubts, lust, anything. She's been through it all. She's been cheated on, broken up with, had seven kids, had a kid die. She goes, what do you got? Nothing phases me. I'd love to. And that's Jesus, but even more so. Everything, you know, I've been, yeah, tell me, yeah, tell me. No problem. I just want to be with you. 
just want to love you. I want to hear you. You are his. He made you. You're not an accident. You're not an accident. You know the happiest you've been is when you're in that flow state, when you're not thinking about yourself. You're not worried about money or your career. You're being yourself with your people. You know, you're being your gift to them. You're, you're being charismatic. Whatever that is, playing your instruments, that's, I believe, very much where God wants us to be in something similar to like what will be in heaven completely out of ourselves, just being how we were made in that moment. And I believe that's the mindset that God gives us insight into here on this earth. Those moments of prayer with Him, these moments of grandeur, moments of epicness, and these are the, the, the lights that break through heaven that come down and shine kind of a shadow here. They're not sad that they're all we have and we're going to lose them. They're just the beginning of what's to happen. They're showing what's going to come. They're, they're to motivate us to go up, not be sad that this is all there is. So all the people in the world that are glamming so hard on just sexual satisfaction at the expense of relationship, at the expense of, of uh, you know, maturity and all this stuff, it's sad because you're giving up the eternal good for these little highs that, oh, the Lord wants to liberate us from. He wants to, he wants to free us up to understand what our real cravings are, where we can go. The Lord says He is the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who comes to Him will never thirst again. And I can tell you right now, the fruits of the Spirit are no joke. I'm not saying I am completely love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But you ask my girlfriend, she'll testify to you. She'll tell you, wow, I used to be such a, you know, hmm. You, you, hmm. I could tell when you went this way, you were about to, but you stopped. And I don't know why you stopped. It's very unlike you. Um, Fears, go. I, I, was it Jerry or Tim said something a few weeks ago that you said, like in terms of fear, I don't know the last time I had legitimate fear about stuff. You said you had concerns, you'd plan, you'd attack it, but the fear, the anxiety associated with the unknown in life tend to dissipate when your rock is God. Or was that you, Keith? Sorry, Keith, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think that's an awesome, awesome truth. You won't vacillate as much in your decisions because you realize it's not all about you. God touches you when you spend time with Him in maturity. You're like, dude, you didn't plan your breath. How are you keeping your heart beating? You're not doing any of that. You're so dumb in so many ways. You're so lucky that it even turned out this way. What makes you think you ever did it? You know, so you're saying, oh, well, I guess it was you. Oh, I guess I can be hunky dory and chill because He had your back the whole time. Knowledge of good and evil. You'll understand a lot more how short you fall and how much of a sinner you need to be when you try to go after God. Yeah. Why is that? It's kind of hard to bring it up and let you say, uh, if you don't think you're bad, you do exactly what you do. You're never going to know what good or bad is. You just always, whatever you do is right. But if you try to be good, you'll realize what good is and how far you fall from it. So you'll learn a lot about good and a lot about bad. So that's also an awesome perk of being close to the Lord and being spiritually satiated. And the biggest thing that blew me away is you know, the Bible says that you, you hunger and thirst for righteousness and wisdom. And you do. You read Proverbs and you're like, oh, that's so cool I learned that. Oh, I want to learn that. Oh, that's valuable. Oh. And before it was like I just wanted to listen to the, to the pop song that came out. Yeah, that's all I needed. And like, why am I getting high off of Proverbs now? This is crazy. And uh, as Pastor Bryce likes to say, the high of walking with the Lord, I don't even read, read about Joshua, read about Caleb, read about Moses, read about these people who do it. Um, they were people just like us. God says you can walk with Him and you can get a high, you can get an experience. You ever hang out with one of your best friends and you're just glad you spend time with them, you're elated, you're happy with how you are because that's what God is. You know, He rubs off on you. Uh, Moses got that sheen, people couldn't look at him because he literally was face to face with God. Um, and one more, one more quote about Star Wars. I love Star Wars. I really think it's an allegory to help people find God. I really do. George Lucas, you're being used. Uh, Luke, at one point, you guys know Yoda, right? Yoda on Luke Skywalker, they're on Dagobah, what's the... Dagobah, yeah. Is it? Okay. Luke's got Yoda on his back. Yoda's this crazy guy that's training him. He sees the hero in him and wants to get him strong. So he, he's punishing him, teaching him all this stuff, telling him to do this. And, and Luke's running. And Luke was breaking down and really having a hard time. And he goes, God, what is... This is so much work. I'm not seeing anything. Is, that just, is the dark side stronger? And Yoda stopped and he goes, No. No. Quicker. More Easier. More seductive it is. And Luke says, how am I to know the good from the bad? There's so much. I don't know. They're all power. They all want to be powerful and charismatic and have control. And Yoda says, you will know when you're calm, at peace. Come on. Passive. Yeah. A Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense, which is killing. Defense can slaughter. Don't get me wrong. But never for attack, never for offense. Jesus, when people came up to him and caused a fight, he'd, he'd end the fight. Verbally, he'd end the fight all the time. He would. 
But I think that's it. Yoda was Luke's trainer. You know, he broke him down. He whispered him things he didn't understand. And Luke said, I believe in you that you believe in me. And I want to believe in that vision with you. I'll partner with you and I'll, I'll do whatever you say. Yoda spoke life into him. Yoda is his trainer and Jesus is our trainer. Simply put, Jesus rides us. He gets on our back. He speaks to us. We may not like it. We may be confused. We may not trust it. We may not know why he said that. I've never done it that way. That doesn't make any sense based on what I've known. But he pesters you and rides you and tells you that you're going to be everything that you ever hoped you wanted to be in everything that he created you to be. And that's his job and that's his purpose to see it in you. So yield to that, guys. Don't yield to yourself. Trust God that he loves you that he designed you to be an awesome, magnificent, radiant reflection of who he is. Yes, everything of you is yours. It is a gift given to you. But it's just a reflection of one of the millions of facets of God that you're meant to share. So you are meant to be, I believe, yes, there's heartache and there's pain in this life, but I don't believe you're meant to permanently live in depression and anxiety. I think that's, that's, that's a recipe to take you out of where you're supposed to be. Very much so. So, that's why. The saying wouldn't be there that the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I like it. Absolutely, I like that. Joy of the Lord is our strength, man. That's awesome. So we got to be craving pure spiritual food, guys. Got to realize some of the needs that we have. We reach out to junk food, uh, spiritual things that we're not meant to do, and it can cause basically uh, a lack of operating, lack of efficiency. It can cause pain, dissension. Uh, we don't love people and act even the way we were supposed to be. Um, and we all, don't get me wrong, we all want wonderful things. We want to have a fulfilling life and have finances, have our needs met, be coddled, know that we're going to ride into eternity and all's well, but the way God brings it out to me is like baseball. I don't know if you guys have ever played baseball or a sport that you have to hit something hand-eye coordination, but I mean, we always want to hit that. We always do, but the moment you get up to, to the batter, you're, you're going to hit it. If you're nervous and thinking, oh my God, how am I going to hit it? I don't want to hit it. Oh, I'm going to get it. You're going to whiff the ball. You're going to miss it. If you're thinking about the reactions, how it's going to be, and that's not how you hit. I'm sorry. I wish it was. I really wish that you could freak out about it enough and you'd hit a home run. No, it doesn't. The training is entirely different, entirely separate from what you would ever imagine. It has to do with quieting your brain, doing nothing but watching the ball. Yeah. Watch the ball. Watch the ball. Don't think about how you're going to hit it. No. Just watch the ball and swing. Try. and Oh, my dad, just watch the ball. If you stop looking at it before, during, or after the hit, you're going to mess it up. Watch it the whole way. And sure enough, and then you just see the ball cruise. And you're like, wow, I did that. How did I do that? You didn't do it. It happened. It happened. In a sense, yeah, you train a lot to allow it to happen by repetitive stuff. I think the Holy Spirit's very similar. You know, you walk, you look to God. You don't know how. I don't know how I'm going to hit it. If I'm doing it right, it's all right. Get, get on your knees in the morning. Open your word. Study it. Pray. Talk to people. Ask. Be hungry. Guys, he'll reward that heart. He's rewarded mine. He's faithful. I guarantee it. Come, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be... I didn't finish writing the end of that. What is that? Beatitude. <laughs> blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be... Help. Okay, we're all good Bible scholars today. Anyway, let's, uh, that's where I'm going to finish. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh, dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that for some reason all of us could be here today in this place and time through all of our schedules, through all of our yearnings, through all of our laziness and other things that we could have done. We're here obeying, hearing your word, growing tangibly, trying to make sense of this life and grow closer to the light, which is you, your word, your son, and how to work that out in our lives, how to apply it and how to walk as children of God in a fallen world. Father, we pray that you equip us, uh, you allow this, this word to go deep and to change and change the soil. Lord God, to cause change in our lives, to grow fruit in our lives and those around us, Lord God, that your, your work will not come back void. Your word will not come back void, but will cause change, Lord God, and cause hundreds and thousands of times of, uh, of uh, intake, of uh, harvest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, sorry. Yes, guys. One more thing. Um, me and a bunch of people have uh, awesomely been working on a church directory. So there's one in back and paper behind the coffee. I think there's only 10 copies right now, uh, but I'll be bring more next week. And if you want to be on there, there's something wrong, email me. My information's on there, and then you guys will be able to contact everyone. So.